All right, so here we are, our very first set of flipped notes. What you're going to need to do is you're going to write these in the Cornell note format like we've discussed in class. And at the very top, you're going to need to put problem solving, the scientific method, and scientific inquiry. It also helps to write a date on this. That way you can make sure that things are in your notebook in order. Before you write anything else, I want to briefly review why we actually take notes. I know that some of you think it's boring, and sometimes it takes a long time to write them. But there's actually a reason behind this, and there's actually a reason behind why we handwrite them instead of type them. We'll talk about that in class, too. But the basic reason that I have you take notes in class is to help build strong connections between your neurons. So you actually are building up the dendrites in your neurons and making connections in your brain. That way it makes things easier to remember. Um, and definitely because you're going to be seeing the notes on the screen, you're going to hear them as I say them, and you're going to be writing them down. It helps you to remember them better and it helps the neurons make stronger connections. That may not mean a whole lot to you now, but when we get to the nervous system unit, it will make a whole lot more sense. This you will need to write. As scientists, we are going to use six basic processes, and we're going to use them in a variety of combinations to solve problems and to answer various scientific questions. So the first basic process is observing, and this is when we use one or more of our five senses to gather information. Now, the really important thing about observations is they must be factual and accurate. Okay, and we're going to keep careful records of our observations. Here we have two examples of organisms that are observing. If this isn't making sense to you about the six basic processes, first of all, definitely talk to me about it. But second of all, in your textbook on page 150 and 151, you will find more information and more examples of the basic processes. So for right now, observing is what you'll need to put on the left side of your Cornell notes. And then on the right side, you'll just put using one or more of your five senses to gather information. Again, this is in the textbook on page 150. Uh, some of the other ones are on page 151. The next basic process is inferring. And I will warn you right now that inferring and predicting are kind of tricky to tell the difference between. But inferring is when you explain or interpret an observation. Okay, when you explain or interpret an observation. Okay, the example in your textbook is if you hear your dog barking, you can infer that someone's at the front door. So you're combining evidence that your dog is barking and your experience or knowledge that your dog barks and strangers approach to come to the conclusion that there's someone at the door. Uh, the only way to find out if an inference is correct is to actually investigate it further. So in your notes, inferring on the left, and then uh, on the right, you'll put when you explain or interpret an observation. The next basic process then is predicting. And this involves making an inference about a future event based on current evidence or past experience. Okay, so this has, is more like dealing with weather, which is why I put um, a picture of some lightning on there. So predicting on the left and then on the right, making an inference about a future event based on current evidence or past experience. Again, this is in the textbook on page 150. The next basic process is classifying. And this is where we group things together that are alike in some way. So classifying, grouping things together that are alike in some way. The next basic process is making models. We make models of things that are either too large or too small uh, to be seen in the classroom. I can't bring the solar system into the classroom for us. First of all, it'd be very dangerous with all kinds of gravity and heat and noxious gases. Um, it just wouldn't fit. So we have models of the solar system. Same thing with DNA. We have DNA, but it's very, very hard to see it. So we have a model of DNA over here hidden behind this smart ink. And then uh, models are used all of the time in real life to demonstrate different things. This is a model of a building. Our last basic process, and I found it to be eighth graders' favorite basic process, is communicating. Scientists have to be able to share ideas and information. 
So some of the communicating that we do in class will be through discussion, but some of the communicating will also be done in writing. Scientists have to be very good writers. They need to be able to convey their information to another person and write down step-by-step -step instructions for how to do an experiment. So on the left, communicating. On the right, process of sharing ideas and information. When we are making observations, some of them will be qualitative and some of them will be quantitative. Qualitative has to do with the quality of something, while quantitative has to do with numbers. So some quantitative observations. We are going to be recording mass. We can use a balance for that, and the unit that we'll use is grams. We aren't going to work much with weight in class, but I want you to understand the difference between mass and weight. So the tool that we'll use for weight is a scale, and it's also measured in grams. Take a moment, see if you can decide what the difference between mass and weight is. We'll talk about it in class. When we measure mass in class, we're going to use a triple beam balance. So the first thing that you need to do is clean off the top of the pan, so you don't want any extra mass on there. And then you'll also set all of the little slides to zero. Back to our quantitative observations. We have three different ways to measure volume. We have the volume of a regularly shaped object, like a Kleenex box, and we'll just use a ruler and we'll measure that in cubic centimeters. We have the volume of irregularly shaped objects, that can be something like a rock, okay? And we'll use um, a graduated cylinder for that. There's more information coming up on that. And we'll measure that in cubic centimeters. We can also measure the volume of liquids or grainy solids using graduated cylinders or air pistons, and we'll use milliliters for those. So back to measuring. When we measure the volume of an irregular object, we're going to use a process called water displacement. So we'll fill a graduated cylinder with water and record them out from the bottom of the meniscus. Water has a high surface tension, so it will tend to creep up the sides. Um, conversely, mercury actually um, dips down and its meniscus is higher. But water has a concave meniscus. From there, we'll actually place the object down into the water. The water level will go up, so we'll record that new water level. And then we'll do a little bit of math. We'll subtract the initial volume from the final volume which means we take that final volume, the bigger number, subtract, subtract our first number, the initial volume, and then we'll know the object's volume. Back to our quantitative observations. We measure length using a ruler, and we use the metric system, so centimeters, decimeters, millimeters, you get the idea. For circumference, you can use a tape measure, or we might use a piece of string and a ruler, and those are the same units that we'd use for length. We will also be taking temperature from time to time, and we're going to use a thermometer for that, measuring in degrees Celsius. For time, we will use a clock or stopwatch, hopefully not necessarily a sundial. Um, and we, we can measure in seconds, minutes, days, eras. It's really important that we use units correctly, and you must remember to write units on things to avoid very serious errors. In class, we're going to talk about two costly errors, um, one that was done by NASA, and then a mistake that happened at a Disney theme park. So to the scientific method, and you've been learning about this for a while now, um, there are basically six steps to the scientific method. The first one is we state the problem. We're going to make an observation using our five senses, and then ask a question about what we see. In the second step, we're going to actually research the problem. We're going to try to find out what it will take to solve the problem, what we need to know, and then what we need to know about the problem to further investigate. The third step is that we're going to form a hypothesis, a possible solution to our problem, based on the research that we've done. Then we're going to test the hypothesis. This is the fun part where we perform the experiment to see if our hypothesis is correct or not. Then in the fifth step, and basically throughout the process, we're going to record our data. We're going to record the facts and measurements from our experiment. And then at the end, we're going to draw a conclusion after we've analyzed the data. And our conclusion should be a logical answer to our problem 
using the data as supportive evidence. Now, scientists do all of those things, but in various orders. It's more like scientific inquiry, which is a more nonlinear process by which scientists solve problems. So it's recursive. Things happen over and over again. This is what's illustrated by the back bulletin board. Um, scientists make observations, gather evidence, propose explanations, and they ask questions. Not necessarily in that order. I know that was a really long set of notes. The rest won't be that long. And we're going to go through these in class together. If you have questions, let me know. And make sure you get everything written down.